welcome to my series about all Chopin's music. Etude in B minor, opus 25, number 10. That's the piece we are going to talk about today. The so-called octave etude. Etude for octaves. Before Chopin, there was, of course, many exercises improving this specific technique, the technique of playing octaves, fast octaves. First, a short introduction to what octave is, especially for those of you who are here, I don't know, by accident or completely not musicians or who just watch me for the first time, whatever. Anyway, just to make a tradition at the beginning, we have to describe a little bit the technical problems of this etude. So all the pianists, again, please forgive me the basics, but it's important for everybody. So the octave is the interval, so the distance between two keys. And from the name octave, from Latin, it means eight. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have to play the first and the eighth note together. And of course, what kind of fingers we can use to play the octave? Everything depends on how big hand we have. Very small hands only can use these two fingers. Bigger hands can also use, for example, this one and this one, or sometimes even this one and this one. Well, I can even use this one and this one. Even I don't have very big hand, frankly, but my hand is very um, supple, elastic. Uh, but we never, we never play octave with those two fingers. Uh, but sometimes we use this or this or this, also in this exercise, well, it's not an exercise, it's study, but Chopin called it exercises, so I, I can. Uh, we can use these fingers to make legato, so to connect these octaves, because of course there are two ways of playing octaves. Um, so just to show you, this is octave, we can also play with these fingers or with these fingers. And there are two ways of playing octaves. The first, the first way is staccato, so... This way, probably Chopin didn't like, because he didn't use it here, in this etude. In this etude, Chopin is writing something more demanding and more difficult. He wants us to connect these octaves, to make a line, to play legato, legato octaves, in both hands, the same octave. So it means we have like four voices, one, two, three, four, and we have to play legato. And this is a little bit more difficult because we have to, we, we cannot really use the wrist so much, like I showed you with staccato. We have to connect, especially the top voice in the right hand. And if I play for you the right hand alone, uh, maybe I can make it even, uh, even a little closer so that you can see how funny it looks. Because I think it looks very funny. So now you can see. No, it's a little bit too close. Okay, so observe what's happening in this part of the hand, where I'm trying to connect fingers uh, with one another. One more time. And, and 
this is the main difficulty in this etude, in the first part of this etude. So now we know what octave is and um, why it is difficult. Because when we play octaves all the time in a very fast tempo, we have our hands stretched. Both hands are stretched like this. We have to play loud and because this is the, the, the first part of the etude is loud, we have to connect. So we, we must have a little tensed. The hand must be tensed. It's impossible to have a relaxed hand when you play octaves. What we can have relaxed is this and we should have it because otherwise if it's not relaxed from here to here, then we feel a lot of pain. We cannot play the etude. Uh, so when we play like this in tempo for a long time, of course, we start to feel pain at the beginning. But of course, we improve the hand, right? Uh, and in this first part of the etude, because the, this etude has the construction A, B, A, something similar to what we had in the etude number five from this opus, uh, E minor. <laughs> joking we have two etudes in one etude do you remember if you watched my video um, one etude with one problem and then there was a middle beautiful part with completely different problem here we have two different parts but the problem is similar all the etude improves uh, the way how the pianist plays octaves but in the first part of the etude we have a very fast tempo in and they have octaves legato and mostly very fast, very um, loud, excuse me. But also we have something uh, very unique, which nobody else before Chopin used. Chopin adds a melody in the middle, because you know what Chopin's intelligence was thinking is like when we play octave we, with this finger and this finger, or with this finger and this finger. Well, we still have two or three fingers which are doing nothing. So, you know, why they should do nothing? If they can do any, anything, there's something they can do because they are uh, um, work workless, right? How to say? They don't have any job to do. So. What Chopin invented here is incredible. I will show you when we are going to talk about the construction, more about this theme. But now I just want to show you again from the close up uh, what kind of technical difficulty it creates. Because when we have to play legato and at the same time we have to keep one finger in the middle for uh, here and then have six notes here. in a fast tempo. Then. Can you hear this? There are like two lines, two melodies. And this also is the same in the left hand. keep it improves the technique very much but what I want to say is that this is very important um, in the construction and in understanding the the music as a language I'm going to talk about it soon but first let's finish the difficulties so as I said the tempo is extremely fast and now I want to show you the, the Chopin's tempo. The tempo is, for me, it was shocking, I must say. i just show you what tempo Chopin writes here. But this is the tempo of the exercise. I mean, if you want to improve the octaves, you should play you should 
practice this etude as long as you can play it in such a tempo. And so on. Very fast, you know. <laughs> Frankly, I'm yet not able to play in Chopin's tempo this etude uh, because it's a completely new piece for me. I had never played before this project and uh, because my professor f at the university thought that it's not for me. He always saw in me the poet, you know, the more delicate and of course we played fast and etudes of course to improve technique but this is he was saying that this etude is for a beast it's for a big man it's for you know to destroy the piano <sighs> indeed so he he thought i probably will not be able to play it well maybe he was right but i have a different philosophy with my students um and this is actually a very interesting uh, topic because you know you know I love teaching I, I think I, you already know it <laughs> so I don't have to tell you but um, with my students I focus of course on improvement so the most important thing in improvement is that we improve the weakest points so very often I but I always think deeply about the repertoire and very often I give to my students pieces that are completely against their nature. Uh, just to stre stretch strength my God, to make stronger their weakest points. Um, of course, maybe they will not play those pieces in public. Because here we come to another point, of course, when you play in public, when you play exam, when you play a concert, it's a very bad idea to go on stage and to show to the public, hello, now I show you what I cannot do. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear what you cannot do, of course. So we have to show our best. So these are two um, separate groups of repertoire when you are a student. Well, even when you are a concert pianist, of course, uh, there are not many concert pianists in the world. There are a few, but these are, you know, the top, top, which play fantastically everything. But most of the pianists are, uh, they, they, they are, they specify in certain parts of a repertoire. Some are good in Mozart, Schubert, you know, classical uh, composers. But they don't really play so much Liszt uh, or 20th century music, Prokofiev, for example, or Rachmaninoff, or some some are very good in Romantic, but then they don't play Bach or they don't play uh, classics. Well, you know, so and it's it's much better, I think. If if you really play something very well, then it's 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 much better to to stay in this. Uh, but it's an open discussion and. Um, very interesting, by the way. I would love to hear also what you think about it. But coming back to this point, we can say and we can see now after analyzing 21 etudes and today we are analyzing 22 that Chopin was one of these pianists that was a complete pianist. He had all kinds of technique, at least from his music. Of course, he was not a concert pianist. He didn't want to be. He never tried he didn't like to play concerts but he played the piano extraordinary well and we we know it from all those people who are listening to him and seeing this score and seeing these etudes that he wrote we believe it and we are sure he was um, so this is the difficulty of the first part we need a lot of stamina we need a very relaxed this is very important relaxed hand here but here it must be tensed because we have octaves. 
but then comes the middle part and middle part is you know it's so fantastically written because in the middle part of this etude we have suddenly another phase of octave i think there is a better word and just let me let me find fast the, the translation yeah face well actually face oh visa vi, visage 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 a ah, visage sorry visage okay visage another visage of octaves another face of octaves so octaves can be aggressive can be dramatic can be virtuoso like with Liszt music or Tchaikovsky concerto you know or Rachmaninoff concerto you, we, you know very very but here also we have a lot of sound but Chopin is showing us that he can also use octaves to show a beautiful melody uh, written in B major so this is the key of love and what are difficulties in the middle part uh, we have to sing with octaves and this is also extremely hard extremely hard because here we need to have a perfect legato so now I want to show you how I practice this and how I recommend all everybody to practice the middle part of this etude the middle part of the etude sounds like this <laughs> so on we are going to analyze it soon so the melody the singing a legato perfect legato melody Chopin writes ben legato means a good legato very good I recommend to practice many many uh, days two hands together playing these octaves like this easy it's not that easy because we need to really play beautiful legato we have to shape the melody when we can do it we are satisfied with this we have to try to imitate to produce the same way of playing using only one hand sorry one one more time let's compare One hand. Well, I still have to work on it. It was not exactly the same, but it was quite close. So this is how I work on this attitude. You know, what another problem that uh, appears here, which sometimes uh, young pianists forget, is that when we play two hands and we want it to sound beautifully, we need to play right hand a little louder than left. Because the top voice uh, is the singing voice the bottom voice is only giving the color when we play with one hand uh, this is the singer because it's the top voice in the right hand and this thumb is has to play softly but when we play octave without thinking which finger is stronger well of course this one you know it's uh, it's you know it they they, they have no chance if they have to fight with this guy this guy has no chance with this one absolutely but so we have to think about it and we have to play deeper the fifth finger and only that or fourth depends and only that that way we achieve a beautiful balance of the sound
So perfect legato, romantic playing and poetry because this etude has a story. It's not only uh, objective music. It's impossible uh, to imagine that Chopin didn't have any feelings while composing this piece. On the contrary, he had very dramatic feelings. He is very aggressive, very powerful, but in the middle part, in the heart of the piece, he showed his real soul. But maybe what is at the beginning, this aggressive and dramatic part, was the reality of him when he composed this etude. And the middle part was his dreams or his memories. This is what I think, and this is what we are going to discuss today in the video. So, these are difficulties, most of them. And now let's go to uh, my favorite part of the video. So the analysis of the structure and the emotions. If you are a music lover uh, and not a pianist, or even if you are a pianist, but you've never played this piece before, never saw the score, I'm pretty sure that for you it sounds very aggressive very chaotic, a, lo a, big, a lot of sound, big mess, uh, you can't really catch the melody, you can't catch the, you know, the, the phrases. Are there phrases in the first part? Uh, so you think it's just, you know, a big house, we are in hell. And actually I think it was, um, who was it? Was it Hunecker, I think, that wrote, let me check. Uh, not here, but yes, but I think the Hunecker wrote that this melody um, uh, is like we are in hell, you know, and the, the, the devil wins at the end. Well, it, we can compare it like this. I, I, I refuse. I mean, I don't want really too much to, to go into this kind of... Um, uh, poetic images describing the music because this we can do by ourselves uh, the goal of this video is different um, but some things are very obvious right so anyway of course that's how it sounds but you know I also thought so when when I was younger when I, I never played this piece I only listened to it and I never really understood it I mean the structure, um, you know, how to really listen to it until I started to practice it and of course I went deeper into the analysis which I love to do and I have to do because every piece that I play I have this rule in my life. I don't play pieces uh, which I don't understand because I want to present to my public pieces that I understand, that I know what's there and usually that I love. When I understand something it's easier to love it. <laughs> Anyway, I now understand and I want to share with you and I want you, as you already probably know if you watch my videos, to also listen to this etude after this video in a completely different way, new way. Okay, let's go and let's do it fast because this video is going to be very long. So hopefully not. I will try to be, you know, fast. Okay, so first of all, the very important thing which probably many of you um, don't know, is that the etude starts from the introduction. We have four bars of introduction and then we are hit by the first theme, like by the first phrase. We are, we are hit, like, you know, you hit the wall. And this is how Chopin wrote it. And that's why uh, when you listen to the introduction, you will probably hear that it's split it into two different parts. The first part is just we are going up in a very fast uh, waves, little waves. The second part of the introduction has a very strange accents. If a pianist is respecting the score, usually the pianists they do uh, these accents, but sometimes they don't do it that strongly. But if they do, we, we, we have like the melody. 
but these accents are not on one and I want to show you because it's even if you are not a musician you can see that this is the second part of the introduction I will play it for you soon and these notes are grouped into three can you see one two three and here we have one line then another three another three another three and these accents are not on the first but on the last note and it two bars so it's not a natural one two three one two three one two three but it's one two three one two three one two three one two three why so just because Chopin wants to surprise us with the first uh, theme the beginning of the real attitude because we have one two three 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 boom and this boom is the beginning of the first phrase is it clear i'm sure it is so i show you i play a little slower okay the introduction <laughs> This was a surprise. I didn't do it perfectly. Let me do it. Let me do it again. One more time. So we start piano, we start soft. Uh, I mean, Chopin doesn't write any dynamic, but if we have a crescendo to forte, it's good to start from uh, silent. We go up, then we have these accents. We are scared, afraid, and suddenly we are hit. Okay, one more time. <laughs> The, the music starts, <laughs> the, the, the first phrase starts um, and also what I showed you before, the melody in the middle starts. What kind of melody we have and what is the first phrase here? Now you will be surprised but it's a regular construction. The first phrase has eight bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, exactly eight bars. And the consequent phrase starts from the same exactly motif like the first one. So it's, it's, it's just a typical Chopin's uh, way of writing, even if you don't believe me. I will prove you now. Um, it's incredible, <coughs> excuse me. But if we listen to this melody in the middle, then it's, it makes it easier for us to understand. So. And, and of course, of course, the faster we play, the the uh, the easier it is to shape those phrases. But let me first play for you only this melody that we are bound to listen to. This is like only two bars I played for you. Isn't it? like the first uh, musical phrase, antecedent phrase. Uh, again. Now how does it sound together with the octaves? Could you hear this melody? sing it and of course we are scared that's how it is we are in hell it's getting dark we are afraid we don't want to be here and now let's listen to the whole first phrase
used to the consequent phrase, and the consequent phrase, just listen, the same. is different like in all the etudes. The second part of consequent phrase is always different. So and here we arrived to the ending of part A, which is we are already in a, such a big drama, so we cannot imagine a bigger drama. But we should be able to imagine because soon we will have a bigger drama. Now this is something incredible. We are already high and we are going higher with the emotions. Chopin will be building up the huge climax that ends with a tragedy, some kind of crash. Like, you know, you drive the car and your brakes doesn't work and you go down. And, and you try, you try so much not to crash, but in the end you just crash. That's exactly how this attitude is. And Chopin writes here, Forte fortissimo possibile. This is not so often in Chopin's music, so that's why I, I want to show you here. Absolutely amazing moment. So let's listen to this uh, part with the uh, building up the climax. Uh, from where? Uh, okay, from here. Too. from Beethoven's very similar I'm sure it is his inspiration from Beethoven I'm pretty sure about it so uh, that's that's how this um, part A is constructed um, antecedent phrase then consequent phrase and then the third phrase which brings us to the climax and we everything ends with a huge tragedy let's listen again to the whole part a and try to enjoy it to enjoy this uh, dark music you know what happens now here uh, it started to snow it's like very windy it's very dark and actually, I don't know if it's the end of the world or is Chopin doing this? I, I have to show you this. You will not believe me. Look, just look what kind of what kind of uh, weather we have. It's exactly like this attitude. Oh my God! Oh gosh! What is going on? I hope I didn't destroy my camera. I really wanted to show you. Can you still see me? Okay, well, this is like scary, right? Oh my God. Okay, anyway, Chopin, thank you. You created a perfect atmosphere for us. <sighs> Terrible. So now we are all in the mood. <laughs> Is it Chopin? 
probably this is the only piece, the, the only other piece that I can think of, which is very similar, is his scherzo from Second Sonata. <laughs> now so I would have to take a look but you know what I'm talking about very similar right but this is even more scary so definitely Chopin is devastated when he puts out from his soul such a music when was it written we don't know but definitely after Polish uprising it must be connected with Polish uprising but also with the torment that he had inside uh, about his love life because now we come to the middle part and middle part suddenly you know when you were so aggressive and you bang the piano like this and Chopin never played like he was not it was not his soul he bangs and then suddenly it's like he says I'm sorry I'm really I don't want to write such a music it's not the music of my heart it's not the music of my soul. My soul is full of love. I dream of a perfect love. And we have B major. And you know, I was thinking, definitely, well, I mean, I was thinking about the process of composing this piece by Chopin. You know, one day I, I always do it before this analysis, but I one day I sat in, in the couch uh, with the score and I started to think and I started to... I'm normal, but sometimes I talk with him. So I started to talk, to ask him questions. And I was thinking about the process. And this process, in my opinion, was first Chopin wanted to write etude for oct octaves because he wanted to write, you know, uh, etude, exercise, many, 24. One of it was for octaves. And then he had to choose the character, the idea, what he wants to, how he wants it to sound. For him, octave could be very powerful. Then maybe he thought, well, he had to choose the tonality, the key. And look how fantastic it is. He's choosing B minor, B major. So the same key but in major is the key about love at least in Chopin's music he wrote many beautiful um, warm fantastic melodies in B major uh, nocturnes in B major we have right uh, beautiful nocturnes we have his Largo from third sonata in B major the middle part of scherzo number one is in B major and so on and so on we can we can look for it a lot and <clears throat> this was uh, love but B minor might be the opposite it might be the, the the lost love right the feelings that Chopin had also when he wrote um, um, Etude Opus 25 number 7 C sharp minor but here he is just you know very dramatic or maybe it's also patriotic maybe he wants to destroy the enemy he wants you know just like in a revolutionary attitude these are open questions um, but I was thinking a lot about it definitely now we have a be beautiful middle part and now let's make analysis you know again a little introduction before I knew the score uh, I don't know if for you, if you don't know the score, if you only listen to this etude, it's not the same. That it's For me it was very beautiful, I liked this middle part, but I felt lost. I f again, I felt, oh, why is it so long? Why is it so, like, it's, it's unusually long comparing to this octave part. I always had this feeling that the middle part of this etude is too long comparing to the parts that are um, outside and it was of course beautiful but I also couldn't catch the phrases exactly like they were not so for me they were not that um, 
natural and they were, they were repeating many times the same and I, I just didn't understand so I had to learn this attitude I had to play it I had to go deeper to understand and now I'm here to do this video for all the world who wants to listen so that you can appreciate this music more because it is fantastically written but we need a little bit of understanding at least in my opinion so now let's do this analysis and now first and fundamental reason why I thought this was boring and too long because 99% of pianists don't respect the Chopin's tempo does it sound familiar to you yes we have a few examples from before so let's start from Chopin's um, original tempo You might be shocked again, but it's not me, it's him. cannot play it with the metronome because metronome is pushing us but the general idea of the tempo I, I don't want you to misunderstand me I'm not playing Chopin with the metronome but metronome is important to understand his vision of the flow of the tempo and you know this is the paraphrase of minor to there we were scared we were lost we were dra dramatic here we are full of love or maybe the memory of love but to connect this is my friends very important in my lecture here to connect uh, spiritually these two parts together with one attitude we must play middle part faster of course it's more difficult uh, definitely it's much more difficult um, to play you know faster this uh, legato and play beautiful melody but then this middle part becomes much um, shorter in time and the relations are just perfect and Chopin was a genius so like Mozart you know always the proportions proportions are very important and proportions are time if we play unusually slow then the proportions are destroyed and this is what I had but I subconsciously felt it in many performances most of and I hope that after this video um, you probably when you hear the slower tempo you will think oh wait why so slow well I do hope so but we'll see I have it anyway so now so this was very important lento right and but another reason why it must be fast is the way it is constructed because the phrases are long so now just one example we had it also in other etudes but i have to do every video again the same thing because we have another time the same problem if we play it fast then listen what kind of phrases we have the first antecedent phrase sounds like this and the second consequent phrase starts from the same motif it had different ending This is the end this was the first musical period it's so clear for me it's so clear but when I hear it slower everything goes twice as long so the first phrase becomes like this then 
the second phrase is like this. But it's something new, you know? It's not the same. It should be. In, in, in Wikipedia even, in, in, in all the dictionaries of music, it says that the consequent phrase should start from the same motif that the first phrase. And this is important. In music theory, it's in the base. It's basic. If 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 a pianist doesn't understand it, I mean, if I put it in the other words, if we have it in a different way, our subconscious feels a little bit strange, awkward. It's not natural for us. So that's it. I proved. I hope. I I hope you understand. And uh, I um, well, you you don't have to agree with me, of course, but. I try to convince you. That's 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 what I'm doing. Um, maybe I'm obsessed. I know, but anyway, let's continue. So um, the first, the first phrase, antecedent phrase. The like the the second part of it will only appear here, only one time. Can you imagine that Chopin, for the rest of this uh, part B in the etude? will be using only the consequent phrase from this first musical period. Only the consequent phrase. This is, for me, hard to understand. It, there must be some symbol. And there may be a symbol of a love that doesn't exist anymore. As we know, Chopin was betrayed. Chopin felt terrible. And who knows? There is something in it because this very beautiful part appears only one time. This beautiful part. I wonder if you realized when you listened to this etude that this is only one time you will never have it again. I wonder. And now let's do it. So, first phrase. Consequent phrase. And then the second part of the consequent phrase is going up and asking questions and is using one motif three times to build this question. Listen, the first one, the first time, second time, and third time. It's like Chopin is saying to his lover, you have left me, you have left me, why you have left me? Something like this, listen. Why? Why? Silence, he asked the question. And then we have a four bar uh, transition, um, a phrase that answers, full of suffering. Look. And again, three times the same motif. First time, second, third. And I want you to remember this, this uh, um, construction. The first musical period, first phrase, the consequent phrase. Consequent phrase asking questions. Then there is a silence. And then after the silence is a suffering answer. And now after this suffering answer, we have a new material, a new phrase. Listen to this. back to the beginning of part a part b but from now on we will always have only the consequent phrase that will ask the question and the suffering answer and that's so easy now to understand so again the consequent phrase and now what happens in this consequent phrase and this is the answer for in my opinion for all our questions in the middle part, we have a quotation from Chopin's other work. Listen. 
Excuse me. One more time. Do you under do you know? He is using it a lot of time. It's a song, Maiden's Wish. Song that he wrote to his lover that betrayed him, Konstantia Gładkowska. You know, so this etude maybe is a mixture of his uh, drama that um, has inside, he has inside because of the war, because of people that was killed, because of Warsaw that was destroyed. Uh, and also his drama and sadness that he had because he was betrayed, because his lover married another man. And uh, all this in the music. And now the question, open question is, was this consciously written by Chopin or is it subconsciously written? Maybe he didn't think about it. Probably he didn't think about it. I wonder, when I die, I want to meet him. And then I will ask all the questions and I will get all the answers and I hope I will be fulfilled <laughs> and satisfied. Anyway, this is very interesting. Um, so we can think about it. There, there is a beauty of, me, of Chopin's music also in this layer. What happens next? I'm not going to play because it's getting too long this video, but what, what's, I will, later I will play the whole thing for you. But now I hope the map of part B is very clear. One more time, slowly. It starts from the first phrase when we have the love, which will never come back again in the piece. Consequent phrase, ask question, dramatic question. After the silence, we have a suffering answer. Then we have a new material. This new material, one more time, because I played it only one time. Oh, new material. And then we have a consequent phrase of part A, asking question and answer, suffering answer. Then again, this new material, and then Again, the third time, the consequent phrase, asking us a question, then the suffering answer, and then we have the transition, a bridge to the dramatic beginning of the etude. Listen now to this bridge, how uh, amazing Chopin f had, a, how amazing idea Chopin had. So after this answer, left hand is taking this motif from the right hand and it's obsessively repeating and the right hand is having long notes and now for Chopin it's very easy to go back to the beginning because if we have this so when we What he has to do, he has to just make rights accelerando, play it faster. And then we have the dramatic part A. And it's a fantastically written. So let's listen to this. Faster, faster, faster. First phrase, do you remember? So. Now Chopin doesn't want us to suffer the hand, you know. He doesn't want our wrists to suffer. 
So instead he just finished the piece. He is building up the even bigger drama than at the beginning. Uh, because this etude ends really terrible. Every, everybody dies here. You know, Chopin writes here in pure forte possibile. So we reach the climax when he writes just, just destroy the instrument. Just bang the piano. Uh, and you know, now I want to tell you that it, with such pieces like this one, we shouldn't think like many people think that Chopin was, oh, he was romantic, he was so sick, he was so weak, he was dying all his life, like I think Berlioz wrote about Chopin. Chopin was dying all his life. Well, he was, of course, weak, but inside his spirit, he wasn't. And we should not think how he played, but we should think how he thought, how this music was inside his head, what he really, how he heard it inside. And we should express this music, what he had inside. Why I think so? Because I remember, uh, I read uh, some of book, I don't remember now. Uh, one student of Chopin played for him the A major polonaise, you know. <laughs> And he broke a string during the lesson on Chopin's piano. And he was so, Maestro, Professor, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't want to. I'm sorry. I, I, I will buy it. I you know. I repair it. I rep and you know what Chopin answered to him? He said to him, was sitting calmly in the sofa and looked at him and said, If I had so much power like you, and if I had been healthy, and if I had played this polonaise, there would be no strings left on the piano after I finish. <laughs> the same here. We reach the extreme drama. And the ending of this etude reminds me of another Chopin's piece. And you tell me which one. Let's listen to this growing to the end. Uh, uh, excuse me. Well, I can't destroy my piano because I still have to record uh, two more etudes, so please. But still, imagine, like, that's, you know, you just bang the piano in a... <sighs> it is powerful. It is dramatic. It's like a weapon. How much power and fire had this man, this weak, sick man inside him. And we also know it from his sonata number two, when he was very bad. He was literally dying, uh, but at, at the end he didn't die at the time. But he wrote at the same time such a powerful piece. And this we have here, we have the same. And you know what reminds me this? <laughs> me of the ending of ballad number one when we also have octaves and this is a completely different key but the spirit of music is very similar right I think it's very similar anyway that's how this etude is constructed I hope now you understand it better and now let me play it one more time with explanation of the construction. So let's start. The introduction. And first phrase. Thank you. 
sorry. And now, first phrase. That's a good phrase. Asking question. Suffering cancer. And then the new material. New material Made a Swiss Answer. And now, yes, we are approaching part A again. Sorry, listen to the left hand. enjoyed this difficult for me uh, episode. See you again in the next one. Opus 25 number 11 tomorrow. Bye bye. <laughs>